Amen. You may be seated. I love that song. Well, I, I am certainly glad to be back in the pulpit. I, uh, I love whenever I, I get to have somebody come and, and, and speak uh, like Paul did for us last week. And I, I hope you enjoyed Paul. I, I got a blessing out of it. Uh, but anytime I'm not in the pulpit on a Sunday, I'm just like, I'm itching. I'm raring to go to get back to it. Uh, and so uh, I think maybe that might have spilled over a little bit this week because I started out with 19 pages of notes. I, I have just been all over the place on this on this sermon. And so I, I, got to, I finally got it wrapped up. I was like, okay, I think I've got everything in here I want to say. Ooh, 19 pages. Okay, I got to cut some stuff. <laughs> That's like double what I usually have, more than double, I think. So uh, uh, we did get it down to 14. Uh, I'm not kidding. It's 14 pages, but uh, it's going to go quick. I, I am excited. I'm fired up about today uh, because we are continuing on with our, our series on Imagine. Uh, you know, we talked uh, a few weeks ago about uh, imagining God as a loving, a loving father, uh, and we talked about how Jesus kind of rooted his identity in being a loved child of God. Uh, and out of that, he gave us an example of how he could embrace his identity. And then from that, uh, that propelled him into his purpose that God had sent him here for. And so, you know, I, 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 we're going to kind of just keep running uh, with that theme of embracing our identity as a loved child of God. And, and you know, we're going to be talking about redemption uh, and, and how that ties into the word blessed. Because we hear that word a lot, don't we? I mean, we use it a lot, of course. You know, we're... As Christians, we love that word, blessed, and, and we even hear it uh, out in the secular world where, you know, well, somebody blessed me with this. That's cool. See you at church on Sunday? Oh, no, no, that's my day to sleep in. <laughs> and so, you know, we hear uh, the word blessed, and, and, you know, it gets thrown around a lot, and particularly uh, it, it, in our culture, it's kind of used as, you know, an association term of getting something, isn't it? You know, like I was given a bonus at work. Cool. Uh, that's great. You know, you were blessed, right? That's, that's what we would say. It was, I was blessed with a, with a bonus or, you know, you might say, well, I was, I'm blessed with my children. I've been given children. I am blessed with children. And I know some of you are going, have you met my kid? You would argue that. Uh, or, you know, you might would say, uh, I love my spouse. I, I love my wife so much. I love my, my husband so much. And I am blessed because I have been given a spouse. And I know some of you are like, have you met my in-laws? I wouldn't say I'm blessed. Uh, and so, uh, Grant, happily, I don't have to say that. I actually do love my in-laws. But, you know, a lot of people have that tumultuous relationship. Tim's patting his head. I'm getting him in trouble with his dear wife. It's, it's all fun and games in here. Uh, but, you know, we, we associate that, don't we? It, you know, if we've been given something, then we say, well, I've been blessed by getting this thing. And, and so we kind of use that as a measuring stick, don't we? we? We say, oh, well, I got something, so I became blessed. Well, it's actually a lot more than that. I mean, there's some truth to that. Yes, if I, got a, I got a bonus this week. Cool. That's a blessing to me. But that's not the measuring stick. And so if we, if we make the, uh, the mistake of associating blessing with worth, then we kind of venture into t dangerous territory. Because, you know, it's easy to say, well, I got a bonus, so I'm blessed. And I got a child, and so I'm blessed. And I got a spouse, and so I'm blessed. But we wander into dangerous territory because what happens when those things go away? What, is, what do we begin to believe about our worth at that point? What if instead of getting the bonus, you get the pink slip? Are you as open to say, I'm blessed? Or what about whenever that child becomes sick and tragically passes away? Have you been blessed? What about whenever that spouse says, you know what, I don't love you anymore. I want a divorce. Have you been blessed? 
Because if we measure our worth, if we measure, use blessing as the measuring stick for just how much God loves us and just how much God thinks of me and just how much God wants to bless me, then you would say, you know what, I've lost my job and I've lost my kid and I've lost my husband and so God must hate me. I am not blessed. And so we wander into dangerous territory there when we simply associate blessing with getting things. And that's kind of what we're talking about. It's not to say that getting those things is not a blessing. It is. It is. My bride is such a blessing to me. Tim, your wife is here, so while she's here, you're going to say she's a blessing to me. We'll see what happens when she leaves. <laughs> but, you know, we, it, it, it's just dangerous territory when we just randomly associate or, or we arbitrarily associate things, getting things with am I blessed or not? And so that's the truth that I want us to kind of examine that today because, you know, yes, there is truth that getting those things is blessing and there, there is some truth to that. Being blessed does not necessarily always look the same way that we quite imagine it. And so we follow that from Christ's example. He had a pretty hard life, didn't he? All of his fan, he had every single one of his followers betrayed him at some point, abandoned him, hung on a cross, persecuted and murdered by the very people he came to save. Pretty hard life. Said he didn't have anywhere to lay his head. He could not rest anywhere. And so if you have your Bible today, go ahead and open it to Ephesians chapter 5. And, and we're going to eventually get back to Ephesians 5. Where we're going to kind of start there and then we're going to go to, go to Matthew and then eventually circle back. To Ephesians 5. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and open it up with me to Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2. And it says, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. Follow God's example as dearly loved children. And walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We thank you, Lord that we have this time to be able to come together and to get into your word, to lift up your name in song and in praise, because, Father God, we are here for an audience of one. We are here to worship you. We are here to grow in our relationship with you. We are here to deepen our faith in you. And so, Father God, we pray, Lord, asking that you would use this entire time for that purpose, to redeem us, to reclaim us as one of your own. And that we would find our identity out of that as a beloved child of God and not out of the things or the circumstances that are going on in our life. So, Father God, bless this time today, we ask. And we ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, you know, kids, they, they learn to model their, their behavior after their parents, don't they? Now, it's funny. I, I read a, a thing on uh, a Facebook, and it was like, you know, you could tell... Your kid, and I, I wish I had taken a screenshot or something because I don't remember it now, but it, it cracked me up because, like, you try to teach your kid one thing, and the kid's like, huh? And you, so you keep trying to teach it, and they just keep going, huh? And you keep trying to say it's something else, and they're like, huh? And then you stub your toe, and a bad word lets out, and they repeat it. Happens, doesn't it? I mean, you ever, like, you get cut off in the, in the parking lot or, or out here on the roads, and you're like, you stupid idiot! Yeah, stupid idiot. Oh, gosh. Of all the things you could pick up on. Uh, but, you know, that, that's what happens. Kids, they model the behaviors of parents, don't they? You know, how you are, that's a very good indication of what your kid's going to grow up to be like. That's just the reality of it. And so that's the importance of, of leading a legacy. You know, that's why it's so important. I love that these kids are in here. The beautiful thing is three of these kids are here and their parents are not. That is incredible. Uh, I read some, some statistics, and this is years ago, uh, but, you know, if, if you can win a kid to Jesus, then it's like 5% chance you'll get the whole family. But if you can win a parent, then there's like an 80% chance that you will get the whole family won to Jesus. And so it's remarkable how much or how important it is, and I just love that these kids are here. He goes to bed at 7 o'clock in the morning, or at night, so he can be sure he gets up in time to be here. 
I don't know about y'all, but I ain't going to bed at 7 o'clock. Although tonight I might. Stupid time change. Your government hates you. I'm just here to tell you. Feels that way at least. But you know, whenever I was a kid, whenever I was a kid, and I know I don't have a good segue for you, so insert segue here. But whenever I was a kid, I used to love to go to the arcade. Did any of y'all do that, go to the arcade? I'll be honest with you. I'm really excited that my, my brother and his wife are having a new kid because now I just, now I have another excuse to go to Chuck E. Cheese again, all right? I loved going to the arcade. And so one of my favorite things about going to the arcade was going and getting prizes from the ticket counter. You know what I'm talking about? And so, you know, I loved doing that. I, I love those games where you'd be like, you, you put $73 into it and then it'd print out two tickets for you because you were terrible at the game, or at least I was terrible at the game. I don't, you know, I, I have terrible eye-hand coordination, but I couldn't spend enough time at that stupid basketball thing. You know, I'd throw 30, 30 of them. I'd sink one. Uh, but, you know, I loved it. I could get my tickets, and I'd run around the arcade. And anybody not get to leave? Tickets? Oh, pfft, sucker. And I just loved to collect those tickets. And then I would you know, I'd be all proud and be like, ah, yes, my tickets. Give me my stuff. So you take them up to the Redemption Center, and I'm not talking about the Redemption Center over at the Waffle House. They're a church, and I'm pretty sure they have no interest in your tickets. Uh, but, you know, I, I loved to do that. And so, you know, if you're a parent, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You've paid $73 for, you know, a spider ring and, you know, two pencils. Uh, but, you know, I just loved that kind of thing. You know, you would, you, know, you take your, your kids to Chuck E. Cheese and you're like, here's $150. Here's my entire paycheck. Just shut them up. Feed them for an hour and let them play games. I just want to take a nap. And so, you know, we let them run around, and they're collecting all their tickets. At least I was always collecting all my tickets. And so now, I know this is not a perfect illustration, but bear with me here, because I know, like, Chuck E. Cheese, they're pretty, they're, they, they're pretty proud of their stuff. You know, they, they inflate the value quite a bit. But, you know, imagine, imagine with me, if you will, that you go to the arcade, and you're like, ah, oh, ski ball. That's my jam right there. 50 points, yes, it's as good as you can get right there. 50 points, yeah, good as you can get right there. I mean, you're just lining them up, man. You're like, somebody got a blindfold. This ain't even a challenge anymore. And so it's like, tick, 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 spitting out all those tickets. You're like, yes, yes, boom. I got all these tickets. I mean, like, you got so many tickets, like your friends and your parents are just falling around. Like, what are you going to do with all of these? And then you leave. You go throw them in the trunk of your car and you leave. Wait a minute. You're like Boston a couple weeks ago. You skipped a step. I got to pee. Some of you paid attention. I like that. That's awesome. Good job. But we skipped a step, didn't we? So what are those tickets worth once you leave that building? Squat. Absolutely nothing. Because you got to redeem those things. Those things have to be redeemed. They got to be turned into something of value, don't they? Because you got to take all those handfuls of tickets. You'd be like, I got 73,000 tickets. I want the bear. Well, sorry, you can't have the bear, but you know, we got a couple of these little round bouncy balls and a handful of Bazooka Joe bubble gum. You remember Bazooka Joe? Only place you get it now is arcade. I'm pretty sure of it. Thank you, Chuck E. Cheese. But the same can be said of our salvation. The same could be said of our of our, our our sacrifices of our lives. Because you know we we were given so much. We we can just be sure that we're blessed like none other. But it, it turns out it turns out that every single good thing that we have, every good word that we say, every good accolade that we accomplish, every good deed that we do. What's it worth without Christ? Absolutely nothing. Every good thing we have or do is worthless. It's absolutely worthless until Christ redeems it. And he doesn't just redeem the good. He also redeems the bad. I've told you the story of my friend Jamie. God has redeemed his life of addiction. He's leading Addicts to Jesus. God is redeeming that. 
I'm able to speak into the lives of divorced people because God redeems that. So God redeems everything, but we have to give him the tickets. We can't leave with the tickets. We can't just throw them in the trunk. I mean, that's what we all have been guilty of doing at one point or another is living out of an identity that is not a child of God. We've all of us at some point, we've said, oh, well, you know, I, I, I got to tell you, when I went to school for audio engineering and I graduated, most that's not been very valuable. I'll just tell you that much. But God has redeemed it. But I was so proud of it. You know, I graduated. I'm like, I'm an audio engineer. You want me to load that TV for you, man? Welcome to Walmart. You need a buggy? God has to redeem it. But I had my identity not in being a child of God. I had my identity in, I'm an audio engineer. I'm an audio engineer. It just sounded good. I was, lie. I was prideful about it. I'm an audio engineer. You know, sometimes we place our value in our job. Sometimes we place it in our family. Sometimes, you know, we place it in our, our stature, our position in the community. Sometimes we put too much stock in what others have said about us. And, and so we begin to place our identity in the wrong things and not in the things of Christ. We don't value our identity in anything other than Jesus. And when that happens, when our identity is found in anything other than Jesus, all of a sudden we're in need of redemption. We, we, we've got these things in our life that God needs to redeem. He's going to have to redeem. Otherwise, it is worthless. And so how do we do that? How do we do that? Well, let's circle back to that Ephesians 5 again. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up. For us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. In other words, I mean, it's right there it is in those first three words. Follow God's example. And then it says he did that through Christ. Follow Christ's example. Okay, well, that's great. Well, what is the example? Well, see, Paul is writing here and he's explaining to the church at Ephesus that Jesus in all of his humanity was still exactly how God intended men and women to be. All the way from the beginning of time. Problem is, men and women all the way at the beginning of time placed their identity in something other than God. And so they had to be redeemed. Therefore, we have to be redeemed. And so the message of the gospel, it clearly shows us that God's purpose, Christ's purpose, by his death and resurrection, it was to restore us. It was to redeem us to God. And so that's what he's done here. And so, you know, if we want to be restored to God, if we want to be redeemed to God, if we want him to say, okay... Here's my junk. Here's the stuff I've placed my identity in and I know I shouldn't have. God, what can you do with my mess? Well, if we're going to do that, then we have to walk as Jesus walks. And I'm not talking about the Jesus walks, the Kanye West song. I don't want to send you down that road. And so, if you would, go ahead and, and flip over to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to spend some time here. Matthew chapter 5. Common passage of, of scripture, uh, part of what is known as the Sermon on the Mount, which is like a much larger thing. But we're going to be really digging into what is known as the Beatitudes. So we pick up with verse 3. It says, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble. For they will inherit the earth. I'm outrunning it again. I'm sorry. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace blesses those who work for peace for they will be called children of god god blesses those who are persecuted for doing right for the kingdom of heaven is theirs god blesses you hear this blesses is in here a lot isn't it when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my follower 
Be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. And so, again, we're looking at what is called the Beatitudes. And so, you know, it is a part of that, that larger Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and I would encourage you in your own time to go through and just read the entire Sermon on the Mount. It's beautiful and it's, it's convicting. It's encouraging. But, you know, Jesus here, he's giving this, this Sermon on the Mount uh, to all of his followers, to those that are following him. He, he's, he, what he's trying to do is he's trying to teach them to become the person God made them to be, or, or in other words, to become redeemed, to become restored. And so, you know, when we, it's called the Beatitudes, that's a word for blessing in Greek. So it could just as easily read the blessings. And we heard that word a lot in that passage, didn't we? Blessed, blessed, God blesses, God blesses, God blesses. Who does the blessing? God does the blessing. Oh, that means he has to do the work. He does the restoration. He does the redeeming. And so when we're examining the Beatitudes, what we're actually examining is what Jesus is revealing about somebody who is blessed, who is being blessed. Now, where in the passage of Scripture there did that tie into anything that you were getting? I'll give you a hint, it doesn't. God's blessing has nothing to do with whether or not you got that bonus, whether or not you have kids, whether or not you are married. It doesn't tie into any of those things. God does the blessing, and it all comes out of the heart. It comes out of the posture of the heart. And so the, the Greek word here is, is makarios. And that's literally translated as somebody who's in a, a position to be envied. Those who are poor and realize their need for him. Those who mourn. Any of these things sound like things to be envied. But God is saying these are position, you know, these are the blessings. People who are blessed. And that's not to say, like, I'm, I'm anti-wealth and anti-influence or anything like that. God redeems everything, whether it's good or bad. He, he redeems every single bit of it. And so what he is saying here, what Jesus is saying is, if you have received the grace of salvation, if you have already received the grace of salvation, then you've already been given everything you need. That is eternal life. And therefore, you are blessed. You are in an enviable position. And so... Jesus here, he's kind of combating. Because even then, same it is, it is now, there's a mentality among the culture that if you're wealthy, if you have influence, the, the more that you have, the more you could say you're blessed. Now, God's blessing can lead to those things. But they're not, they're not hand in hand. You know, if, it, if, you're, if you're a poor church planter in McMinnville, Tennessee, not to say I'm not blessed. I'm blessed out of my mind, y'all. But it has nothing to do with those things that I could or could not attain. It has everything to do with what God has given me. And so Jesus, what he's doing here is he's like, all right, value system, we're going to flip that upside down. We're going to teach you what real value is, y'all. And so what he's helping us to do is he's helping to realize all that junk, man, all that's, a, that's, that's just... That's temporary. But God, he, he doesn't operate on the temporary. God operates on the eternal, y'all. And so he doesn't want us to think that our circumstances. He's, he's trying to help us to get out of that mind frame that circumstances equals value and worth to God. Because we could dangerously just perceive those as things of God's blessing or judgment, couldn't we? But that's not what he wants us to do. And so he wants us to now, just as he did then, to realize God's kingdom. And so... Your key takeaway, the one big point out of all of this is this. Blessing is not a state of living. Or, I'm blessed, sorry, blessing is a state of living, not what we are given. Blessing is a state of living, not something we are given. Because we all ex accept, don't we, that, that Jesus is, is the perfect example of how God intended man to be, right? We all accept that. He is the model man. New Adam, yeah. We all good with that? Online, you good with that? I'm good with that. Cool. So, in fact, there's nothing material in this life, okay? He's given a definition of this is who God intends you to be. Living blessed is just simply a result 
of a life lived with Jesus. So you can have absolutely nothing in this life. And we've, some of the most blessed people, some of the most joyful people that I've ever met in my life typically have been the ones who have squat. You know what I'm saying? You've met those people who are like, you know, you, you barely have a, anything to, to call your own. But you have such a joy and a radiance about you. I want some of what you've got. Those are the people we, we see that we could say, man, that's a blessed person, couldn't we? That's a blessed person. And so you, you might have lost that job. You might have lost a loved one in life. You might have, have, have had that divorce. But because you have Jesus, you have Jesus. And because you have Jesus, you know that you are blessed. You know, you might be ridiculed for being a believer. It's getting more and more to that point. I think it's, I think it's an exciting time, honestly. I don't know where I'm going with this, so bear with me. But I think this is an exciting time because, you know, it's easy to look around and lament the state of America, right? And how far she has drifted and what that means for the church. Because, you know, a lot of churches are closing door. I read uh, online this week that 2,000 churches close their doors every week. 1,700 open. I don't know if you're good at math. I'm not, but I, I did the math. That means... 300 fewer churches every week. That's the reality. Sounds scary, doesn't it? But when do we notice the light the brightest? You ever go to the movie theater and like you watch a movie and it's full of dark and grim and it's like a horror movie and then all of a sudden they flip the lights back on and you're like, oh, 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 The light shines the brightest in the darkest times, doesn't it? So I think it's an exciting, I think this is a glorious opportunity for us, for the church as a whole, to shine the light of Christ, and it will shine that much brighter. And I don't know where that came from, but I just want to encourage you with that. Because you have Jesus, you are blessed. So let's get back to where we were. And so, you know, as we're, as we're getting into this, we're going to kind of pick th these Beatitudes apart just a little bit, but I am going to rush, because I do have a million pages of notes. And so... We're going to dive into what it means to be blessed according to God. So Jesus opens up and says, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him. Who realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And so Jesus, right off the bat, he's like, all right, guys, I got this really long sermon for you. You think Pastor Kevin's sermon's long? You ain't heard nothing yet. I got this really long sermon on the mount for you, but... First off, I got to I got to do the introduction. I got to set the tone for what the rest of the sermon is going to sound like. You got to set the tone, and so right off the bat, he's saying God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for Him. But he's not talking about whether or not you got extra zeros in your bank account. He's talking about a posture of the heart, and so he's expressing here that there's a need for us to be humble. That's what he's expressing a need for. Is you know, we, we have to realize our humility towards God, and that is recognizing our need for Him. That we cannot live without Him. We cannot live without mercy towards others. You ever get a bill that surprises you? Like you open it up, you're like, <laughs> I don't know what to do with that. I mean, like we had a really cold January, right? So probably that's, pretty, that's a pretty familiar feeling for all of you. I remember whenever we were having a leadership meeting, uh, right after all those really cold weeks and you know Tim's like because usually our gas bill here is like what 130 ish and then he's like yeah I've got our gas bill today it's 280 dollars or whatever it was it was close to 300 dollars and we we're just like <laughs> God <laughs> you know you get those those bills and you open it up and you're like it's $200, and I got $100 in checking. Oh, dear. What am I going to do? And, and, and so in that moment, you really become aware of two things, don't you? That's four. You become aware of two things, don't you? you you're aware of what you cannot afford, $200, and what you have, $100. So you're aware of what you cannot afford, and you're aware of what you need. There's a $100 discrepancy here. I know what I need. 
And so Jesus is kind of teaching along those terms. He's saying, guys, there's a heart posture here that we got to start with. You know, you, you'll read this in a lot of translations where it says, blessed are the poor in spirit. So it's got nothing to do with your wallet. It's got everything to do with your heart. Blessed are the poor in spirit. He's not saying you're blessed if your bank account's in the single digits. Because I would be blessed a lot, just here to tell you. But he's saying every day, every single day, we have to approach God with the knowledge of two things. First of all, we have to approach him with the knowledge that we have nothing to offer him. The debt is too big. We have nothing we can offer God. And the second thing that that will help us to do is we, we will realize that he is everything that we need. He is everything that we need. And so when we begin our day, when we begin our day with those truths in our minds, then we're positioning ourselves for God to continue to redeem our lives, to use our junk for his purposes. And so, you know, we, we, we have to abandon that pretense that we can restore ourselves to God. Be like, yeah, I'm a follower of Jesus, and now I, get, I got to do all this stuff to make myself worthy of his love. Because I'm here to tell you it will not happen. You cannot do enough things to be worthy of his love. Christ did all the worthy things. And so we have to associate with him. We have to identify with Christ. And so when we get, begin with that, we begin with we have nothing to offer and he has everything that we need. So it's not our poverty. It's not, our, it's not that we can't even afford the bread to eat on. It's not that. It, it's not poverty that makes us blessed. It's our trust in God that makes us blessed. And then Jesus continues on. He says, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now, you know, at first glance, you would kind of read this and think, God likes it when people are depressed, right? God likes it whenever people have got loved ones that are passing away, and, and so they're having to mourn about that. But he's not actually talking about that. He's talking about when we mourn brokenness. When we mourn, mourn the brokenness in our own lives. When we mourn the brokenness in the world around us. Then we will recognize grace. We will recognize that there is nothing that we can do about it. But everything that can be done about it is in God. Because grace is in God. And so we will be comforted in knowing that we recognize the power that God gives and frees us from the sin in our lives. I, I love what 2 Corinthians 4 teaches here. It says, therefore, therefore, we do not lose heart. We do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our fight and our momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory. There's that word again, eternal. That's what God is concerned with. Eternal glory that far outweighs all of our temporary. And then I love this. So we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is unseen, or what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. What is unseen is eternal. There, are we picking up on a theme there? It's the eternal that we have to be in mind of. And that's, that's where we recognize. So when we mourn over our sinfulness, when we mourn over the brokenness of this world, we're recognizing that God is above it all. And if we fix our eyes on him, we fix our eyes on the eternal, we will be comforted. I have to hurry. Ephesians 5, or I'm sorry, Matthew 5, 6 says, uh, or 5 and 6 says, God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Now, verse 3 says, bless the humble, or the, the humble are blessed. Then we come back to verse 5. It says, God blesses those who are humble. So we've got poor in spirit, we've got humble. And that sounds like the same thing, right? It sounds redundant, doesn't it? But it's actually not, because being poor in spirit, you know, that's, that's an inward understanding. We talked about that, knowing that God has, is everything that we are not. He has everything that we are not. And now we're getting the humility. That's our outward expression. That's how we live as a result of it. So that others can see their great need and our great need for him. And so, you know, history, culture, it has a way of, 
of kind of reminding us, of telling us, doesn't it, that uh, we have we got to do whatever it takes. What's what's saying? Take care of number one, and who's number one? Ourselves, right? And so that's what culture will tell us that even at the expense of others, we got to build ourselves up. We got to make ourselves look more important. We got to raise up our t- stature. We got to be an audio engineer. But Jesus is offering a different view. He says, hey, you guys, you've got to deny yourself of worldly praise, of worldly exaltation, and you'll be blessed. You know, he was crucified on our behalf. That's pretty extreme. He says, uh, you know, those who hunger and those who thirst for justice, they will be satisfied. You know, anytime we're, we're hungry or we're thirsty, we're, that, that's an awareness, isn't it? That's an awareness of a need. Whether it's a physical hunger, where it's a spiritual thirst, we're aware that there's a need. And so it means we have to look outside of ourselves if we're going to be filled. And so what are you hungry for? And I know some of you are like, I'm, wait, I'm hungry for this sermon to be over so I can get to the Chinese buffet, Kevin. But Jesus says that those who are hungering, those who are thirsting for righteousness, for obedience to God, that's what he's talking about. If, if you're driven by a thirst for obedience to God above all else, you will be filled. So do we crave that? Do we crave a life that more than anything else just pleases God? Is that what we crave? Then we move on to verse 7. Maybe. <laughs> God blesses those who are merciful for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure for they will see God. So talk about mercy. You know, you ever heard the cliche you know, that talks about the distinction between grace and mercy, or, you know, grace is getting is not getting what you do deserve. Mercy is getting what you don't deserve. You, you guys heard that? Well, the, Paul reminds the church at Ephesus there, it's by grace, Ephesians 2, that by grace we have been saved. We've gotten, we've not gotten what we deserve. But mercy, that's another gift altogether, and that, that's, that's a gift that God gives us. It's the joy uh, of having a personal relationship with him. Guys, we're not just saved from hell. We are given a merciful gift that we do not deserve of a personal relationship with God. And so we got to be people who share the grace of Jesus and then invite people into the mercy of a relationship with God. And then verse 8, we pick up, God blesses those whose hearts are pure for they will see God. This is a really simple statement, but it's really profound, isn't it? He's, exact, he's, he's actually asking us. He says, those who, whose hearts are pure. How do we know that? It means we've got to examine. We've got to look inwardly. So he's asking you. He's asking me. He's asking everyone. Whose kingdom are you really building? Are you building his kingdom or are you building mine? And then he continues on, and I'm trying to hurry. God blesses those who work for peace for they will be called children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right. So he's blessing those who work for peace or who are peacemakers. He's blessing those who are persecuted. Uh, God blesses you when people mock you, when they persecute you, they lie about you and say all sorts of evil things about you. In other words, you're blessed when you're a peacemaker. You're blessed when you're persecuted. You are blessed when you are slandered. And do all these things sound enviable to you? So we got to flip our heart posture. Because let's think about these terms really quick. Peacemakers, persecuted, and slandered. Now, when you read these verses, I want you to think about the cross. Think about the cross. Jesus hung on the cross, right? Now, there is a verse in Scripture, and so to the Jews, this is a big deal to be hung on a cross. Because according to Jewish tradition, if you were hung on a tree, that means you were especially cursed. If you were hung on a tree... You are cursed. And so Jesus flips that. You know, to the Romans, that's what they would do with failed revolutionaries. Hang them on a tree. Hang them on a cross. So to the Jews, it was a symbol of cursing. And to the, to the Romans, it was a symbol of a failed revolution. And so whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, seeing Jesus hang on that cross, it would have been uh, a symbol of a, to them, it's the complete failure and, and uh, of a person who had been cursed. Because the, the Jews, they thought Jesus was going to come and start this big revolution. He's going to take over the government, yada, yada, yada. And obviously we know he didn't do that, not in the sense that we, the Jews were thinking of. 
So if we think of a revolution, we don't think of somebody who says, I got to turn the other cheek, do I? But that's what Jesus did. He knew that he that he was embodying all this symbolism when he went to the cross, that he was going to look like somebody who was cursed, that he was going to look like somebody who had uh, failed to spark a revolution. And he did that just by the message, because of the message that he taught, that he lived out. And so even as he was hanging on the cross, as he was being taken to his death, he was mocked, he was slandered, he was tortured, he was persecuted. They placed a, a crown. Yeah, okay, king of the Jews here, have a crown of thorns. Ha ha. Here's a plaque that reads, king of the Jews. Ha ha. He's being per persecuted and mocked and slandered. But he's saying, before this ever happens, all the way back at the beginning of, of the Sermon on the Mount, he knows these things are going to happen to him. He says, hey, you know what? Those who were persecuted, those who were slandered, they are blessed. And he did that out of what? Out of obedience. He set aside his pride and he was obedient to God. So all of these things, they're mile markers. They're all mile markers for are we walking? Are we imagining redemption and walking out of it? Are we surrendering to him every single thing and watching him do these things? I love mile markers. I don't, I don't know if you drive a whole lot. You know, every time we go down to, to her parents, uh, you know, Got that long drive all the way down there, and I love seeing them, but I hate that drive. It's long, it's boring, and so, especially when you're coming back, usually we'll go for a weekend, so we have to get up at like 4 o'clock in the morning on Sunday to get back here in time for church, and so that means you're just... And so, once we get on 75, I start counting down mile markers. I love mile markers, because I know as the closer I get to 353, for me, that's the marker. That's the last one before I cross the state line, and I'm I'm home. I'm home. That's what these are. These are markers for us to recognize just how close to home are we getting. Just how close are we getting to letting God redeem everything. Because redeemed people are humble. Redeemed people are repentant. Redeemed people are meek. Redeemed people are pure, peacemakers, slandered, persecuted. Redeemed people are obedient. They're merciful. And so when we display all these attributes that God says here, we're being blessed, aren't we? But it has nothing to do with the things that we have. It's instead, I love 1 Corinthians 127. I love this verse. Indeed, God has chosen. God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Are you weak are you weak anybody else feel weak all the time i see the world around me i think golly what can i do about this good news good news that is exactly what god has chosen to shame the strong in other words when we are weak what does, this, what does scripture say in his weakness i am strong my strength is made perfect in your weaknesses. When we are weak, we are blessed because we are in a position to be redeemed. For all of our junk to be redeemed. So only with God could we see this widely recognized symbol of failure, the cross. See that turned into a symbol of victory. Anybody else get excited when they, they see those little crosses hanging on people's necks or they walk into a room and they see a cross and, you know, I'm home. I'm among my people, right? It was a symbol of mockery. It was a symbol of failure. And God said, nope! Symbol of victory. It's my son, Jesus. God takes what is broken. He takes what is weak and turns it into something that can shame the strong. So this is what God wants to do in you. This is what God wants to do through you is to be redeemed, to redeem your junk. He wants to take the pieces of your life that you present to him. You say, you know what? I'm broken. I'm a failure. Everything I have tried to do is a failure. Here's my pieces. And God says, hey, I, I can work with all this stuff. I'm glad you brought your tickets to me. Let's see what we can turn that into. It's going to be a whole lot more valuable than two bouncy balls and a handful of Bazooka Joe bubblegum. 
So my question to you is, are you surrendering everything to him? Every weakness, every strength, every fault, every failure, every succession. Are these the symbols of your failure? Because if they are, he'll turn them into symbols of his glory. 11.33, I did all right, y'all. Are you headed in the right direction? Let's pray. Father God, we love you. When we surrender to you every piece of our lives, let this be the day where we each of us say, here's my junk, Lord. Use it, and use it to shame the strong for your glory. Whether we're in the house tonight, whether we're watching online, wherever we may be, it's the right place to say, here I am, Lord, use me. Here's my junk, Lord. Redeem it, because I promise you he can. So, Father God, let this be the time when we say yes, yes, and yes to giving it all over to you and everything that we feel too weak to carry on our own. We don't have to, Father God. We can surrender it to you. So, Father God, let this be the time where we imagine redemption and we embrace redemption knowing that we are loved children of God. And that you want to use everything in our lives for your sake, for your glory's sake. And we will be filled. Your scripture promises that. So, Father God, let this be the moment that we say yes to surrendering everything to you. We ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand and sing.